Why do we always hear that Jews can't believe in Jesus? Jesus himself said salvation is from the Jews. And he died with the sign above his head, Jesus of Nazareth, Yeshua HaMashiach, King of the Jews. I want to show you a really exciting clip that just happened from Newsmax. Rabbi Kurt Schneider, can I start with you on this? And if you can tell us, uh, the viewers, uh, the meaning behind this holiday and what it signifies. Well, it's a very beautiful time of the year, as you said. It's the celebration of the Jewish New Year. There's another interpretation of it. It's called the Feast of Trumpets. And there's an additional meaning concerning the Feast of Trumpets. The Lord blew the trumpet from heaven when he gave Israel the Ten Commandments and the kingdom of God broke into the world. And as followers of Jesus, we believe that the Lord will once again break into the earth with the blowing of a trumpet at Jesus' return, which is soon. And uh, Rabbi Alan Green, can you talk to us about some of the events that we can expect to see around the world? <laughs> well, I'm reacting to that statement about the followers of Jesus. Um, Jews are not followers of Jesus. Um, I imagine there are some followers of Jesus who celebrate the Jewish New Year, but this is uh, not what I was expecting to hear on this broadcast. As far as events during the year, why would he say Jews are not followers of Jesus? I'm a Jew. My mom's Jewish. My dad's Jewish. My brother and sister are Jewish. I was bar mitzvahed in a conservative synagogue. All my friends were Jewish growing up. How am I not Jewish because I believe in Jesus? Jesus was a Jew. The apostles were Jews. The New Testament was written by Jewish writers. The apostle Paul that wrote most of the New Testament was not only a Jew, but he was, a, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. So why is it today that there is such a strong sentiment amongst both Jews and even some Christians that you can't be a Jew and believe in Jesus? I want to throw you a second clip, then I'm going to explain all that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Jesus was a Jew and all his followers were Jews. When Yeshua, Jesus, was crucified, there was a sign above his head that said, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Jesus is the most famous, influential Jew that ever lived, and the first church was all Jewish. So for my brother and my friend to say, Jews cannot believe in Jesus, it's a total oxymoron. Look at my book, Messianic Prophecy Revealed. Check me out online, discoveringthejewishjesus.com, and look at my YouTube channel, and you'll discover the truth. I've got to say, two rabbis coming on. I did not, uh, uh, did not anticipate a, a disagreement here. Rabbi uh, Alan Green, Rabbi Kurt Schneider, thank you so much. for. You know, if you repeat a lie long enough, people eventually begin to accept it. As truth. And so to think that Jews are no longer Jews if they believe in Jesus is a complete oxymoron. The whole movement of Christianity was actually an offshoot of Judaism. In fact, did you know that the word Christianity is nowhere even in the Bible? The word Christ is in the Bible three times, but the word Christ is just the Greek word for Mashiach, the anointed one, or Messiah. And the New Testament was written in Greek because it was the most common language of the world at that time. And the Lord wanted the message of Yeshua of Nazareth, of Jesus the Messiah, to spread to the entire world. And because most of the world knew Greek in terms of comparing it to other religions, that's why it was written in the Greek language. Listen, believing in Jesus is the most Jewish thing a Jew can do. That's why I wear these payas. I'm making a statement to myself in the earth unto the Lord that following Yeshua of Nazareth, the prophesied Messiah, the one that died on the cross once again with the sign over his head, King of the Jews, and is coming back from heaven, according to the book of Revelation, as the lion from the tribe of Judah, following him is the truest and most authentic expression of Judaism there is. What other Jewish prophet walked on water? What other Jewish prophet rose from the dead? I want you to hear the words of Peter in the book of Acts, chapter 2. Hear the word of God. Men of Israel... He's speaking to the nation of Israel. He's speaking to Jewish people. If you're Jewish, I'm speaking to you. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God 
with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him from the dead, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Do you know the whole faith, the whole movement of, uh, of those that are following Yeshua rest on this point that Peter is making? Did Yeshua really rise from the dead? Well, let me put it this way. The movement of what we now call Christianity has spread across the entire world. Why? Because it really happened. In fact, Paul speaks about all the people that were still living at the time that he wrote the New Testament that witnessed Jesus' resurrection. They actually witnessed Jesus had appeared to them after he rose from the dead. And Paul says Yeshua appeared to, at one point, more than 500 people that were still living at the same time. The reason this movement, this, this, this movement of becoming disciples of Jesus has spread to the world is because what the New Testament hap says happened really happened. You see, Paul, the writer of most of the New Testament, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees before he began to follow Yeshua. In fact, Paul was so upset about this disruptive movement that the New Testament calls the way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And it was called the way in the New Testament. Paul was so upset, his Hebrew name is Shaul, that, 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 that this was disrupting the traditional form of Jewish expression of worship. He was actually hunting down any Jew that was confessing Jesus to be the Messiah. And on his way, hunting down Jews to arrest them that were following Jesus, the Lord appeared to him supernaturally, blinded him. He fell off the horse he was riding. And then the Lord spoke to him in the Hebrew language and said, Shaul, Shaul, that's Paul's Hebrew name. Why are you persecuting me? And Shaul said, who are you? Paul said, who are you? And he said, I'm Yeshua of Nazareth. I'm Jesus, the Messiah. And that totally, totally, absolutely changed the, tra the trajectory and the passion of Paul's life. Why would he have, he have made such a sudden change? Why would he have been willing to give his life? Why was he writing the New Testament from prison, still testifying that Yeshua is the Messiah? Because he encountered, beloved, the living and risen Savior. You know, a lot of times uh, uh, Jewish people reject the message of Jesus because they say that it's anti-Semitic. Because after all, unfortunately, people that have called themselves Christians have persecuted Jews for almost 2,000 years calling Jews the Christ killers and every other thing in the book. Jews have lost their lives and it's been a terrible tragedy what, quote, the Christian church has done to the Jewish people, God's first covenant people whom the Lord declared were the apple of his eye. The New Testament is not anti-Semitic. When the New Testament uses the word Jew, for example, in the Gospel of John, in a way that seems derogatory, John was not talking about Jewish people in general. He was talking about the religious leaders in Judea that were persecuting those that were following Jesus and trying to discount who he was. Listen actually what Paul said, the writer of most of the New Testament in Romans chapter 9, verse 1 through 4, showing how much the New Testament expresses love for Jewish people and how Jewish it is. So once again, why would this rabbi have said Jews don't follow Jesus? The whole, new, the whole First Testament church was Jewish. The whole, the whole church in Jerusalem was Jewish. So over time, what happened, I'm going to show you, anybody that believed in Jesus was excommunicated from traditional Judaism, just like Yeshua prophesied would happen. But I'm going to get to that in a minute. First, I just want to show you how much love Yeshua and Paul had for the Jewish people. This is a Jewish thing. Jesus said, salvation's from the Jews in John 4, 22. He was talking about salvation and him is from the Jews. Jew, Jews that follow Jesus, they're following the true Messiah. This is authentic Judaism. Listen again. Romans 9, verse 1 through 4. Paul says, I am telling the truth in Christ. And right now, again, I would just want to stress the word Christ. It just means the anointed one, the Mashiach in Hebrew. He says, I'm not lying. 
My conscience testifies with me in the Ruach HaKodesh, or the Holy Spirit, that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from a Sheikh, from Christ, from Messiah, for the sake of my countrymen, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites. This is a Jewish thing. To whom belongs the adoption as sons and daughters, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple service, and the promises. And Paul goes on in the next chapter. He says, brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is for their salvation. So this concept that Christianity is anti-Semitic is totally nonsense. Yes, there's been a lot of people that have called themselves Christians and have been deceived and have got a wrong perspective of who the Jews are, but nowhere is that taught in the New Testament. In fact, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 11 that Jesus is coming back when Israel gets saved. Yeshua's return, beloved ones, is connected to Israel's salvation. Now listen what Paul continues to say in Romans chapter 10. He's speaking of the Jewish people. He's speaking of Israel. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. In other words, all Israel and all humanity is guilty before God. The New Testament says that in the flesh, everyone in the book of Ephesians chapter 2 is by nature a, children, a, a child of wrath. Why? Because the flesh is selfish. The flesh is not thinking about God in the purest sense. I mean, sure, they're religious people, they fear God, they honor God, but in terms of truly having the Spirit of God living in them and manifesting from them, it's not present outside of receiving the Spirit that God gives us when we receive Yeshua. And so what Paul is saying here is that God came to earth clothed in humanity and then he took the sin of the world upon himself and died in our place, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. This is what Isaiah 53 teaches. So that the only way that humanity can be forgiven and stand blameless before God with our sin removed is when our sin was transferred into the innocent one, Yeshua the Messiah, who died in our place. See, the wages of sin is death. And so if someone doesn't die because of our sin, then we're still guilty. It doesn't matter how many good things we do, still we've all sinned. This is why in Orthodox Judaism, they have a ritual that on Yom Kippur, they take a chicken and they wave it above their head, take a look online, and then they break the chicken's neck and they say, this chicken died for me. The whole concept in Judaism is that the shedding of blood is necessary, that an innocent one has to die in the guilty one's place for the guilty one to be forgiven. This is the whole purpose of Yom Kippur. When we read in Leviticus 16 and 17 that on Yom Kippur, the high priest of the Jewish people would go into the temple and in the temple was the Ark of the Covenant where the Ten Commandments were housed. And the high priest would take in the blood of a bull and the blood of a goat and pour it on top of the Ark of the Covenant for the sins of God's people. He covered their sin because blood was shed. The life of an innocent animal, the innocent bull and the innocent goat was shed on behalf of Israel's sin. But it was only a type and a shadow. See, Leviticus 17, 11 says, the life of the flesh is in the blood, saith the Lord, and I have given it to you on the altar to make an atonement for your soul. For it's the blood by reason of its life that makes atonement. Not prayers, not ritual, but a blood atonement. An innocent one dying in the place of the guilty is the only remedy and redemption that we have for a guilty one to be released and freed of his sin. But what happened was Yeshua came and he was contradicting the teaching of the religious leaders of his day. In fact, what Yeshua taught was that a lot of the teaching of the religious establishment of his day was hypocrisy. Now, should that shock us? 
I mean, hasn't there always been hypocrisy in religious institutions? Haven't people that have held on to power, whether it's in the government or whether it's in religion, hasn't there always been corruption? That's just human nature. So Yeshua came, he started pointing out the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and then on top of that, he was doing miracles. Even Josephus, the Jewish historian, documents that Jesus was accused of being a sorcerer. Now, Jesus was no sorcerer, but he didn't know what other words to use because it looked like Jesus was doing magic. It wasn't magic. It was supernatural healing by the power of God's Spirit. They accused Jesus, the religious leaders of his day, of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub, the chief demon. Jesus said, if I'm casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub, how is this house going to stand? Because any kingdom divided is not going to stand. But if I'm casting out these demons, Yeshua said, by the finger of God, know that the kingdom of God has broken in. You see, so Jesus not only contradicted the Pharisees and pointed out their hypocrisy, but he also was doing miracles that no one could deny. And so this caused an explosion. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees were terrified because the common people began to follow Jesus. They said about Jesus, who is this man? He teaches with authority, not as our scribes do. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you. Let me read you an incident of Yeshua's words and ministry in the book of Mark chapter 7, verse number 5 through 9. Now, before I read it, you should know that traditional rabbinic Judaism has 613 laws that Orthodox Jews are commanded to keep. Now, many of these laws we cannot keep because of the fact that the temple is no longer standing and there's no longer a priesthood. And as a follower of Yeshua, I don't feel like I'm under the law, but I also see the beauty in the law, and I want to take into my life those beautiful principles that are applicable from the law into my life as I'm being led by the Spirit and following Yeshua. So I don't just throw away the law, because the Bible says in the New Testament, Paul said, the law is holy, righteous, and good when it's used lawfully. So Christians just have this loosey-goosey feeling like, oh, it doesn't matter anymore. We believe in Jesus, almost like we can do anything we want. No, the law is holy. And when we approach the law with, 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 with the holy fear of the Lord, we can see into it the glory of God and learn how to apply, apply the principles of it to our life. Not being under legalism, but being led by the Spirit. But what happened was the Pharisees were so zealous for the law that God gave them. I'm not talking about the 613 rules. I'm talking about the Ten Commandments and the instructions that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. The Pharisees were so zealous, the religious establishment was so zealous to keep those laws that they began to add laws to them to prevent people from breaking them. And what happened was they added so many laws onto the law that the Lord gave that they lost their way. So listen to this incident once again in Mark chapter 7, verses 5 through 9. Hear the word of God. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk in accordance with the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with unwashed hands or unholy hands? But he, Yeshua, said to them, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy about you hypocrites, as it is written, in vain do they worship me. He's quoting the Lord here. He's quoting the Father. In vain do they worship me from the Old Testament, the Tanakh, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men, neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. He was also saying to them, you are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. So what's happening here? is that these Pharisees had had all these rules. You know, eating with your hands unwashed, washing cups and dishes. I mean, you have all these laws today in Orthodox Judaism, and even though these laws may have come from a good place in terms of wanting to do the right thing, they actually led people away from the two true spirit of the Lord. Let me give you kind of a comical example of this, uh, kind of this hypocrisy that Jesus was pointing out here, how they added all these laws and then some of them, uh, you know, just became ridiculous and just total hypocrisy, separating people from God rather than bringing them closer into a relationship with God. And please understand, my beloved Jewish friends, this is not meant in any way to make fun, but it is kind of funny. 
So in Judaism, in Orthodox Judaism, there's a very strict conduct of modesty, which I love and I wish we had much more of that in the Christian community, in the disciples of Jesus. Modesty, so important. The Orthodox community gets my kudos for so much of what they do, because I think it's beautiful. But again, a lot of it is just, it's stuff that they're doing that, you know, they made up themselves, they think it's equal to God's word, and it, it can get kind of ludicrous at times. So in reference to the code of modesty in rabbinic Judaism, women, once they get married, are not allowed to show their hair in public. They have to cover their hair so that they don't attract any men to themselves. So once again, married women in Orthodox Judaism cannot go out in public places with their hair exposed. So what they do instead is they wear wigs. But here's the funny thing. The wigs that they wear oftentimes are gorgeous. The wigs are much prettier in, in many cases than their natural hair. So you see the hypocrisy of it all. Oh, we don't want to attract any attention to ourselves, so we're not going to go out with our hair uh, exposed. So they put the wig on to fulfill that, but the wig is more beautiful than the real hair. I think it's kind of a little, a little, uh, you know, a little to me. You're like, wow, you know, come on, don't don't we don't we see this is is going on here? You know, Jesus is a Jew and he loves the Jewish people. He wants to help them. He sees what's going on. He sees that some of this stuff was ludicrous and nonsense and keeping people from God. And I say that respectfully. I'm just telling you the truth. Like the example that I just gave should kind of, you know, make a point of that. Listen to what Jesus said to the Jewish people and his love for them. Matthew 27, verse 37, he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stone those who have been sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were unwilling. And so Yeshua is like reaching out to this religious nonsense. I mean, listen, this isn't just the Jewish people that have religious nonsense. We've got it in the church, right? It's whether you're Protestant or you're Catholic, we've come up with a ton of religious nonsense in our own expression of our walk with God. I mean, I remember when the Pentecostal movement started, you know, they taught that a woman had to wear her hair in a bun. You know, just crazy stuff. Uh, so this is not particular to Judaism. It's rather particular to, to mankind and humanity and the way that it makes its way in to religion. And Yeshua is just pointing it out because he came to his own people, the Jews. Jesus said he was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But what I want my Jewish brethren, my beloved friends to understand is, there seems to be a sense oftentimes that, you know, as Jewish people, we're the holy ones. We're the chosen people. But the reality is, if we look at the word of God, we don't find a record of the Jewish people acting rightly with the Lord. The scriptures, the Tanakh, tells us very plainly that the, the overall, the history of Jewish people from the beginning was not a history where they related rightly to God. In fact, they were continually getting exiled and getting punished and having different plagues come upon them because they weren't walking with God. All you have to do is read the Tanakh and look how upset God was with Israel because they wouldn't be faithful to him. In fact, listen to the words that the Lord said to Moses in the Torah, in the book of Devarim or Deuteronomy, chapter 31, verse 16 through 18. The Lord, yud heh vav -Heh, said to Moshe or Moses, Behold, you're about to lie down. This means he was about to die. You're about to lie down with your fathers, and this people will abandon me and break my covenant, which I have made with them. Then my anger will be kindled against them on that day, and I will abandon them and hide my face from them. And they will be consumed, and many evils and troubles will find them. And unfortunately, we know that the Jewish people have had a lot of suffering over the years, just tremendous heartache. So they will say on that day, is it not because our God is not among us that these evils have found us? And unfortunately, because of some of the evils that have come upon the Jewish people, many Jewish people lost faith in God. And they said, where is God? Where was he? When the Holocaust happened, I mean, it's a, it's a, you know, we have to, you know, understand that, uh, you know, people were suffering tremendously and they just didn't know what to do with it. But Moses predicted this would happen. Uh, and, and uh, 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 
You know, so, so, so you look at the history of the Jewish people, myself being Jewish, Jesus was a Jew. Listen, this isn't anti-Semitic. I'm just speaking about the facts. God predicted that Jewish people, read Ezekiel, read Jeremiah, would suffer because they weren't walking rightly with God. And so Israel has tremendous guilt, as do I, as do all of us. The Bible says that all of us, everyone, all of humanity, is by nature a child of God's wrath. We've all sinned against Him. But Jesus came, Yeshua came, to save us from our sin. And so Yeshua said to the Jewish people, to the Jewish people, Yeshua said, unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sin. You see, Moshe Moses prophesied that someone was going to come after him that was going to be the salvation of Israel. Many times Jewish people, they, they think that Moses is the end, that the greatest prophet is Moses and there'll never be anyone greater than Moses. And they rest all their hope on Moses. Yeshua actually said Moses was going to be the one that was going to stand against them because listen to what Moses wrote. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18 and 19. This is what the Lord said. I will raise up for them a prophet from among their countrymen. Moses is speaking. The Lord is saying what God's going to do. The Lord is saying what he's going to do through Moses. I will raise up for them a prophet from among their countrymen like you. The Lord said, I'm going to raise up Moses in Israel, a prophet from among them like you. And I'll put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them everything that I command him. And it will come about that whoever does not listen to my words that's coming through this prophet, that I, will, I, I will require it of him. In other words, and he's going to be cut off. Peter quoted this exact portion of scripture in the book of Acts that I just read for you. God said to Moses, I'm going to raise up Moses, somebody from amongst your people, and whoever doesn't listen to him is going to be cut off. In the book of Acts, Peter quoted this exact scripture and said, Yeshua is that one. So why did the Jewish people reject him? I hate to be so blunt, but it's because, beloved, the Jewish leaders were jealous of him and afraid of him, and they wanted to hang on to their power. Isn't that the way it always is? When you hold power, you don't want to lose power. That's why Israel today rejects Jesus. You see, it goes all the way back to the New Testament. For example, in the Gospel of John chapter 9, remember Jesus healed the blind man. And the blind man, once he was healed, he went around telling everybody, he healed me, this, the, Jesus healed me. And, 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 and they, they called him in, and, and, and the Pharisees called him in and said, what happened? And he said, I don't know, all, all I know is I was blind and now I see. And, and they threw him out. Then they called his parents. And they started questioning his parents. And his parents said, well, he's an adult. He can speak for himself. And, 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 and then they said, you know, why is it that, that uh, here's a man that was blind from birth, and now he's healed, and you're accusing the one of healing him uh, of being some false prophet. Listen to John 9, 22. His parents said this. Okay, basically, uh, they, his parents didn't want to say too much. So he, he says here, his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already reached the decision that if anyone confessed him to be Christ, he was to be excommunicated from the synagogue. And so there was this pressure. Jesus is doing this miracle, and people are afraid to talk too much about even their own healing because they're afraid of the Jewish religious establishment you know, martyring him, you know, not necessarily killing him, but uh, uh, in the case of Lazarus, that basically took place. I mean, here, listen to what happened with Lazarus here. So Yeshua had ra raised Lazarus from the dead. And so listen to what happens in John 11, uh, beginning in verse number 47. Therefore the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council meeting, and they were saying, what are we doing in regard to the fact that this man is performing many signs? In other words, Jesus is doing all these miracles and the religious establishment is terrified because the masses of Jewish people are starting to follow him. And those that were being healed, they're testifying, but they're afraid to say too much because they knew that if you testified that Yeshua was the Messiah, you'd be excommunicated from your people and put out of the synagogue. 
So now Yeshua had raised Lazarus from the dead, the ultimate miracle, and I mean thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of Jewish people are now believing him and following him. And so the Pharisees and religious leaders get together about this problem, this, this, this explosive problem that they're having. They're losing control of the people because the people are now following Yeshua rather than them. So once again, listen what, listen, listen what happens. Therefore, the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council meeting and they were saying, what are we doing in regard to the fact that this man is performing many signs? And if we let him go on like this, all the people will believe in him. Now get this. If we let him go on, the power that he has, the miracles that he's performing, the, the way that he's speaking, if we let him go on, all the people will believe in him. They said they were threatened and afraid. And then they said, and the Romans will come and take over both our place and our nation. And then it says in verse 53, so from that day on, they planned together to kill him. This is where the rejection of Yeshua, Jesus, by the Jewish people started. It goes back to the Pharisees of Jesus' day. And why do the Pharisees want to kill him? Because they were afraid of losing their power. That's the genesis of the whole thing. And so from every generation of Jews, since the Pharisees, it's been passed down. Jews don't believe in Jesus because it is passed down from the Pharisees who are the origin, listen now, of today's modern Orthodox Judaism. So the Orthodox Judaism today has its roots in the Pharisees that call for the crucifixion of Jesus. And why do they call for the crucifixion of Jesus? There's a few reasons, but the first and main reason was they were threatened by him because they were losing their power. We could get into theological issues on another, at another time, and there's a YouTube link here that will take you to some of my uh, talks on that subject, or you can get one of the books that I've written on, the, on this very subject. But the, the point is, beloved, that Jews reject Jesus today because they grow up in homes and they learn by osmosis that Jews don't believe in Jesus. Just like the rabbi said at the beginning of the clip, Jews don't follow Jesus. Jews don't believe in Jesus. Why? Many Jews, if you ask them the question, they don't know why. They just know that they're not supposed to. And it all goes back, beloved, to the reason that I just said. So I hope this was enlightening for you. True Jews meaning Judaism in its most authentic expression comes from those that are following the true Jewish Messiah, Yeshua of Nazareth, who came to save his people first, the Jewish people from their sin, and every Gentile that will put their faith in him as well. It's an awesome thing to understand the Jewish roots of our faith in Yeshua HaMashiach, the prophesied Jewish Messiah and Savior of the world.